ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to day three of traditional golf architecture week. We've shifted venues now to something a little more intimate. I uh, hope it meets with your approval. Um, now, uh, today we have another action-packed series of fascinating papers which will delve into the subject of traditional architecture and the many uh, interesting uh, aspects that can reveal about the history and heritage of Gutter and its region. Our first panel today, panel five, on connections, exchanges, and influences will be chaired by Ragaya Abu Sharaf uh, from uh, Georgetown University, our next door neighbor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first things first, I'd like to extend my appreciation for Dr. Onley. Thank you so much for inviting me of being part of this uh, fantastic gathering. It is also great to see old friends, Mr. Ardalan and uh, architect Ibrahim Ajeda and Fatma Fauzi. So um, it is uh, my pleasure uh, to chair this panel, Connections, Exchanges, and Influences. Uh, this is panel five of the program. Uh, I would like, before I start inviting speakers, uh, to ask them if they could please uh, introduce yourselves, as uh, they are not here featured in the, uh, uh, in the program other than affiliation. Uh, our first speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Shimon Pantipadi uh, of Liverpool University to speak Qatar, the Gulf, and the exchange of religious architectural traditions. So please, Shimon. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, uh, I think those who were present yesterday, I have, and bits of day before, I have uh, spoken who I am. I'm uh, Shoman Bandopadhe. I'm uh, the head of school and the James Sterling Chair at Liverpool School of Architecture, uh, which is the oldest school of architecture in the RIBA system, uh, 120, 21 years old. Um, but my uh, connections with uh, the Middle East is from 1985, when I started as a young architect, uh, sort of having arrived, and, uh, and then uh, beginning to become interested in the Lower Gulf, especially Oman, uh, where I lived for about five and a half years. But then after that, uh, I have pretty much spent most of my academic life uh, having then moved to UK to spend most of my academic life in researching Oman, um, uh, mainly OSS settlements in the Dakhli, what is called the Dakhliya region, which is the central part of Oman. But more uh, so, uh, there is a monograph which focuses on some of the cultural ideals as, and social ideas about, social organizational ideas about how these settlements were structured, uh, gave meaning to architecture, and how these uh, ideas were moving over time, across time, uh, across a very, very long period of time, but also uh, in terms of uh, geographically as well. Um, more recently, I've been working on a book on Muscat, uh, which hopefully will focus on the, the, the port, but uh, again, to look into uh, how certain key moves um, uh, sort of shaped up uh, the Muscat uh, area over a long period of time, but mainly focusing around the sort of uh, 18th century to early 20th century. Um, and uh, yesterday, I proposed to the audience um, a new proposal that, uh, thanks to James and his interest in uh, this area as well, that we have begun uh, talking about, which is to do with uh, really looking at the architectural heritage of the Gulf area, the entire Gulf area, and to find out a way of documenting and pulling that together, because those resources are going away. And if we are not careful, that they will disappear very, very soon. And so this is an, a fantastic opportunity under the auspices of the, uh, the Qatar National Library to actually pull that range of material together. And we are hoping that this proposal will um, uh, be formalized and that we should be able to start work soon. Uh, a lot of material has been collected and a lot of material is pledged as well, so therefore there is an opportunity of a fantastic uh, uh, repository building on uh, another, uh, another's earlier work on Gulf urbanism, which is a fantastic base on which I think we can uh, put our architecture on, as, as it is always the case, you know, so it's infrastructure 
and then architecture on top. I'll talk about uh, today about a few quick things, and I'm, I know the t time is short, so I'll rush through a few slides. Talking about some of the, uh, the yesterday I was talking about how some of the political, cultural, uh, social ideas uh, on a broad scale uh, changed settlement patterns in, in the lower Gulf in Oman. And today I'm going to talk about a slightly more detailed level of work, which is focusing on the mosque. Uh, the mosque is uh, obviously quintessentially a kind of important part of uh, um, our uh, architecture, our settlements, our presence, and our identity. Uh, but that has also been shaped over time, you know, um, uh, in various ways and with various in influences coming through. And again, focusing on the lower Gulf, I'll pick up on two or three uh, key uh, shifts and how they have changed it. But also I will end with a study of, um, and why, again, photographic material, for example, is crucial um, to understand how certain s developments took place, how changes took place, and I'll, I'll end with that particular story. So um, this is in, uh, in, a, in a small place called Bilad Zahran, in uh, near Taif, in uh, Saudi Arabia, where we have a, piece of rock which has been sort of shifted, changed minimally to actually make a mihrab, to make a prayer direction, a qibla. And uh, that is probably a kind of a very important, interesting indication of how natural landscapes can be transformed with human cultural intervention. And that, I think, is at the essence of what we are um, looking at, is how human landscapes are transformed by uh, uh, sorry, cultural landscape, uh, physical landscapes are transformed by these cultural interventions. That is a kind of very early mosque, but uh, in in Saudi Arabia. But as we have been hearing yesterday, and obviously uh, uh, architect uh, Ibrahim Jeda's work is very important in that, and he has explained that very clearly yesterday about the the, the nature of the the mosques in in Qatar, but also uh, the nature of the mosques in Saudi Arabia, for example, as well, where there is a kind of wider cultural tradition that has been at work, um, and that extends to uh, not only here to Bahrain and to along the coast as well. Uh, key features of that one are, and if I can just summarize from yesterday's discussion, is a kind of, uh, there is a minaret, there is a frontal access to these settlements, and again, uh, I think uh, the, the exhibition of uh, Claire's work and Vincent's work is absolutely fantastic in uh, indicating that. Um, it's a frontal access to a prayer hall uh, with a, a, a courtyard or a shan or a barra uh, in front, a minaret possibly on the corner on the edge of the, uh, the, the courtyard wall. And uh, there is an, uh, this direct relationship. And then there is a mehrab uh, on the Qibla wall, which projects out, which pushes out from the wall, as you can see at the bottom as well and over here. Um, so these are the kind of key features. Often there is a staircase which connects up externally, as you can see in some of those examples there. Now, the mehrab, the member, uh, and uh, this sort of frontal axis, this is the kind of story here. And if you look into, as I was saying before, that Bahrain to right, right across the the Gulf um, and the littoral, the coastal area, we find that this particular fo format is being used. And you can go farther down in Oman into Sur as well, and you'll feel, see the same thing with the kind of uh, minaret on the corner and the similar kind of structure. This is from Bahrain, thanks to uh, Professor Donaldson from uh, Scotland. Uh, quite a few years ago, he uh, sent me this uh, incredible slide. Uh, these buildings are obviously no longer there. And the other one is from Sib in, uh, in Amman, uh, on the coast. However, um, one of the things I want to sh say here is that while we think that the mosque is one a type, but it, there are kind of myriad of kind of typological variations. And it is very important to understand those sort of shifts and differences. And um, I will focus again on my favorite place, Mana, in central Oman, uh, it because, simply because it kind of, in a nutshell, pulls together a lot of these examples. Uh, these are more recent um, uh, drone photographs from Mana, uh, which uh, we, Haytham was present as well at that time, uh, last, mo last month, literally. Um, if I can just summarize some of the qualities of the mosque there. Um, 
as opposed to the kind of frontal axis and the, uh, the open arcade that actually links up in the, the Qatari mosque and the Saudi mosque and the Bahraini mosque, we find a kind of closed box here. It's a very closed, solid volume uh, with small openings, uh, openings for as doors and windows, and nothing more than that. And they are often also laterally accessed, not frontally accessed, or frontally as well as laterally accessed. And the other important thing is that there is no minaret in, uh, in Omani Mosque. And often that has been translated as, um, interpreted as uh, a result of subsistence economy. Uh, that is not necessarily the case, and uh, I think there are many reasons why I will go very briefly into that one uh, in the next couple of slides. So uh, as you can see on the, the plans of these mosques, uh, these are all from Mana, uh, the, the relationship between the solid volume and its courtyard, the barra, is, uh, uh, is, as I say, a lateral one in many of these cases. Um, and you would find uh, that this is consistent across um, that no minaret, just an axonometric which will highlight that lateral axis, uh, Kibla wall here. Uh, there is a small domical projection here called the Buma, and then uh, the courtyard and the relationship here. Um, we see that consistently across central Omani mosques of the Ibadi um, uh, denomination, where you have this. Uh, uh, the, the, the particular form, as I was describing before, the lateral axis turning round, therefore, uh, on entering, turning round at right angles to, to face the Qibla uh, and the Mihrab. And often also, as you would notice in many of these cases, except the one at the top end, which is a slightly different situation, um, all these were actually, the Mihrab is not projected. The Mihrab is part of the wall. And that's part, partly because of the Ibadi uh, interest in uh, uh, letting the Imam or the Muazzin not be, being uh, kind of separated from the congregation. And that, so the, the depth of the Mihrab would have actually allowed a person to move out of the congregation, and that is, that is what is prevented here. Um, uh, but also, I think the, the one on top, which is a very old one, and in fact, that has got one of the oldest decorated mihrab. In Oman, there are about 26 or so decorated mihrab, which appeared from about, the first one is 1252 AD, and then after that, there is a hiatus, and from 1503 onwards till about 1829, there is a whole range of mihrabs being created. The main period is 1503 to about 1656, I would say, where, which is the main period of mihrab creation and uh, decorated mihrabs. And they also receive, and I'll show you in a moment, uh, these porcelain bowl inserts into, into that. <coughs> that one is the oldest one with the 1252 AD uh, plan of the mosque, but also the very heavy um, uh, sort of uh, the structure and the kind of buttressing actually shows the, some of the kind of key problems that they were having with Persian uh, invasions, especially the tribal groups like the Rais and so on, who were, again, we heard yesterday about the very close relationship we had between the two sides of the Gulf. And it is often this kind of migration back and forth which uh, created quite a lot of tension. And one of the reasons why this was so uh, heavily fortified is because this, it was to prevent it and almost give it a kind of fortress-like appearance with a uh, tower at the end, is to prevent some of the destruction that was taking place in Nizwa at that time. So this is from Nizwa. Uh, the others are from various locations within the area of Nizwa, Central Oman, and so on. Now, that piece that I talked to you about um, over there at the top is called a Buma. Uh, which has got no Arabic uh, origin to the word. Uh, the Buma has got variously um, uh, the silu the owl, or uh, also the, the uh, even the uh, the funerary structures, the domical structures are often known as Buma or Buma. Now. Uh, the links are to old Arabian, uh, or North Arabian languages and also to uh, the kind of broader category of uh, uh, languages, Semitic languages, and that's connected to the idea of Bama, sacred high place, and the kind of uh, the positioning of betils or sort of uh, 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 lithic elements you know, within that, as you can see in the um, the various uh, coinage that was struck uh, in that. The, on the left hand side is a sort of uh, Greek influenced uh, South Arabian coinage which shows the owl. And, but there, so variously what you would see in 
the whole history of uh, Arabian Peninsula culture is this use of the, the owl, the bama, and the kind of the funerary structure being used interchangeably and in different scales. So there is a kind of issue of expansion, diminution, and you know, replacement, displacement, and so on. Um, there are various uh, positions where the owl is seen to be um, an unquenched spirit, which is, needs to be quenched in the kind of uh, the traditional, uh, the classical um, Arabic uh, uh, set of uh, heroic poetry and so on. And that's, that's a kind of uh, interesting origin. And in fact, that word and its original meaning is retained in areas like Habura in, in, on the coast as well, where the word is retained within the, uh, the, the local languages, the local uh, dialect structure. Um, and the third one is the mehrab, as I was saying, that this is an example from, uh, this is the mehrab in Mana, uh, which is 1529, uh, in the, the Masjid al-Jama in, uh, in uh, 1529. However, as I said, the first one occurs in 1252, which is this one, and that's a kind of more developed one in 1505, which is uh, where it starts to kind of begin to expand. Uh, we are never entirely certain about why and when uh, and how exactly that uh, uh, the 1252 piece came about. Clearly, there is a significant uh, Iranian influence, perhaps, and there are um, we can, one can trace back connections across the, the Gulf to the other side, but also equally there are possibilities of uh, Mamluk uh, Egyptian uh, traditions coming through as well. Uh, this needs more work and uh, there, is, there, there are many theories and I, I, I have my own theories about, and I strongly believe that it's probably the Iranian side that, that prevails in this case. Um, ha however, uh, you see then that this appears almost as a kind of total total piece, finished piece, which is unusual uh, in this case, which would suggest that um, craftsmen were kind of were brought in and they, they did the work over there. However, then 1503 onwards, what happens is quite interesting because of redistribution of wealth um, from uh, the previous Navahina rulers, and that then is invested through the, the walk of into, into the various settlements and so on. And hence, there is this since the revival of the Ibadi Imamate that was uh, being pushed forward through these decorated pieces as well. There's a kind of conflict there, and there, there are kind of various views about why that would have existed. And some of those views are to do with uh, mystical traditions which have prevailed since uh, Arabia, uh, had that, that somehow kind of congealed into some of those, those pieces. However, what we see also is a kind of very strong um, sort of external influence coming through, which is about Chinese trade. The Chinese porcelain trade happens uh, over a very long time. Um, you know, the, uh, Arabia has taken in Chinese porcelain over a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. However, in this particular case, what you see, that piece there, but also the 1503 one, which I haven't put on, has, uh, there was a shipwreck at the north end of uh, the uh, um, um, Philippines in 1491. And that 1491 catalog actually has exact replicas of this, uh, the uh, Phoenix in flight, this particular one, as well as the chrysanth, the five chrysanth ordering, which uh, occurs in the 1503 one. There are exact replicas of that which were there. So. One of the things that uh, is very important to understand is that before the Portuguese were actually there, the Omani trade, Omani uh, elements, groups were actually trading, and mainly through possibly areas like Kalhat, or in the hinterland of Kalhat, or in Korea, these were the ports through which uh, material came up to the Central Arabia. And uh, those porcelain pieces are predating a kind of surge of actual porcelain trade in the Yariba period, of, or post-Portuguese Yariba period. So we have this uh, interesting insertion. There are a number of issues about how this lustrous piece was inserted into it and why that was sort of seen to be relevant. Of course, it's a kind of a special, you know, it's like the silverware that you kind of put on the mantle. But on the uh, other hand, there is more to it than just that. So what I was trying to show in this is that um, there is this Central Arabian tradition, 
there is a uh, Omani tradition, the central Omani tradition. And then there are these sort of edges of, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, which begins to pull in various kinds of influences. And the influence being from internationally from the Chinese trade or the, uh, across the Gulf from the, from the Iranian side of things. But also the influences were flowing across and uh, across the, along the edge, but also across the land. Uh, so what happens is that uh, later on in the late uh, 18th century, early 19th century, there is a kind of uh, influence extending from Central Arabia in terms of the Unitarianism that was uh, being pushed politically as well. And uh, we can see the kind of influence of that across the whole of Arabia. And uh, what here is a kind of very interesting example is when we were doing the work in uh, Sanao, that first of all, one thing that we realized is that the porcelain bowls, the motifs, are in a way displaced by shifting it at right angles or turned round, so that they are never presented as they are, as in, in the case of this you know, which was, could have been a temple, you know, on a bridge, you know, which is a typical uh, th uh, piece, uh, a typical representation, but it's shifted around at right angles or tilted around. So Phoenix in flight is normally vertically up. It is turned around as well. That doesn't make so much of an impact, but this one certainly does. But also what we see here is sort of interesting things that are happening sort of in the late 18th, early 19th century. Um, that is that um, these uh, uh, sort of figurative motives are being sort of scooped out, you know, and uh, it is being taken out or being painted over uh, or being uh, completely covered over, as you can see with this one right here, again from Sana, where uh, some of these bowls have either been taken out or been um, covered over. Now, the other one on the right hand side is more interesting as well, while there's got a, a lot of very interesting stuff on um, locust um, infestation at that time uh, in the, uh, you know, quite late, that is sort of mid uh, 19th century, but also there is, uh, I think, uh, underneath it, there is a lot of uh, decoration which was then uh, stuccoed over. So what is, and that is, one part of it. The other part is, so there is a kind of move away, if you like, from this decorated tradition which was being uh, established in the 16th century, a move away from that. Also, we can see that influence of that uh, kind of Central Arabian tradition on mosques. Um, in Ebri, Sulaif, we have this mosque which was uh, rebuilt around that time, sort of uh, looking at the Mehrab member in, in insertion. Uh, we know that the, the Unitarian groups, the Wahhabis, uh, were present here and they had a, uh, a sort of post, outpost at the top end of this uh, Salaif, uh, uh, and that is, that is, that is uh, historically mentioned. So we can begin to see that how some of those influences, of cultural influences, were kind of penetrating into that. So what is therefore happening is within a very short time from 18, 17, 80s uh, onwards, there's a kind of, uh, sort of influence pushing across the land side of it through Boreini, Ibri, Salah, <coughs> and down to Bilad Bani Buali. This whole area then begins to transform in terms of its uh, religious architecture. But that's not only the case, that you would find that on the coast as well, there are new exclaves being created. So um, if you look into the, uh, the Kawasim from Ras al Khaimah, you know, they set up an outpost here, just next to Muscat, which is uh, the piece here. It's an ancient site. It's called uh, Bandar Jissa. It's a very ancient site, which has got uh, pre-Islamic um, tombs and so on, uh, burial grounds, and uh, various other kinds of features. Mainly dependent on fishing because of this sort of very uh, isolated location and the kind of c contained uh, position of it. But And the Portuguese uh, obviously set up uh, uh, gun battery uh, over here, kind of, uh, so that this is a kind of raised platform from where they could uh, look across the Muscat Bay. Uh, but what is also interesting is that they, um, this group, as they arrived, they also uh, brought in their own cultural uh, uh, traditions. And so you find that mosques uh, now here, uh, which is essentially kind of uh, a Sunni Kawasim mosque, you know, which begins to show the kind of uh, telltale signs of the, the, uh, the projected mihrab and the kind of Central Arabian uh, paradigm. However, what I don't show here, and what is very interesting, is that 
what do they decorate their pieces with? You know, externally and internally around the mihrab, you find these kind of very interesting Indian motives, you know, around that. And that's precast and then laid out. So you can see that even in a simple mosque like this, the kind of very complex overlays of uh, cultural ideas, there is, um, they are taking, uh, there, there is a, a, a type that they bring in, they are overlaying that with many other kind of typological insertions and so on. So, just a very quick one, another piece of influence, and then probably uh, um, probably st should stop, right? Um, uh, the, just one more uh, tradition, which is the, the in influence of the, the Baluchi groups coming in here. Um, we see that there is, in 1870s, Mascot Extramuros is kind of a whole patch of um, uh, sheds and you know, reed huts. And the changes really take place at the beginning of the 20th century, where we have the establishment of the, from the, around the t Treaty of 1920s, Treaty of Sieb, um, that uh, we find that there is a, a need for setting up the, the, the musket uh, um, levy corps, and that is mainly f supported by Baluchi mercenaries. And there are, uh, first of all, there were Sistani Baluchis who were brought in, but it was found out that they cannot, they are not very good at standing, uh, withstanding um, uh, malarial attacks. And I think the winter was quite uh, a bad time for them. So the Sistani Baluchis were then replaced uh, in favor of the Gwadar Baluchis and the Baluchis who had already existed in Muscat. So you find that there, are, there is this sort of very renewed influx of the Baluchi groups uh, in, into Muscat. Uh, also, they were, t uh, they were being laid off every three or four years. Uh, that's a p period of work they could do. And that means that if you think about people staying over and building up this extramuros area, that was quite significant increase you know, over a very short period of time. So you have these sort of various settlements coming up, you know, in this, uh, uh, this is the old musket wall, and these are the kind of various settlements coming up from the late 1870s to uh, into the 1920s, 30s. And you see a lot of these mosques have very strong uh, Baluchi influences, which are, in the, especially those finials, you can see that they're very closely connected to some of the Baluchi mosques you'll see in, in Gwadar and other places. All these things also influence Ibadi mosques back. So, al Khor Mosque, which is uh, the mosque that was an Ibadi mosque, uh, mainly used by the royal family, actually, you see that it has got the buma, it has got the kind of solid volume of that, very close to the, the fort, and you can see that sort of continuing to have its presence. But then, you can see just still here, you have the, uh, the buma still visible, but what has happened is that on the edge, a new minaret has been built up, and this is sort of in the early 20th century when it was felt that it would be a good practice to actually bring that in. So just what it then goes to show is that how some of these uh, uh, influences, so from Central Asia, so if you think about Oman having a kind of Central Omani uh, type, and then on the coast there was another type that was extending out, but uh, also the central Omani type was essentially um, um, sort of uh, built on a very ancient tradition of Saudi Arabian types, possibly. Uh, the central uh, uh, Arabian type was actually pushing its influence across, both through the land, but also along the coast, to begin to influence and shape up some of this architecture. So what we see is a kind of essentially a very complex mix-up of these traditions. On top of that, you have these other traditions coming through, which is, a, of course, the international trade, the Chinese uh, porcelain trade, and so on, but also the Persian uh, influence on the, the craftsmanship and so on. So that really shapes up uh, the exchanges in the lower Gulf area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shimon. Uh, next to speak uh, is uh, Shabu Jarba of Qatar University to speak on history, cultural flow, and architectural heritage in the Sultanate of Oman. So please, he's not here? Ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> uh, 
I'm in Shaibugarba, and I'm just going to talk about uh, Omani architecture. Again, you've just listened to one presentation, and it's gone into the, the depth of history, trying to describe different influences. So I'm not going to touch on that. Yeah, OK. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not going to go into uh, again. My 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 presentation is not going to focus on influences or how to try to tr see the traces of influences and how they affect architecture. Rather, uh, my concentration is. Uh, I I remembered uh, uh, we started a debate a long time ago when I was in Saudi Arabia and we had uh, Mashari and Naim and another faculty from King King Faisal. And uh, the debate was, uh, should we be a, a kind of that, uh, one was saying that you have to treat heritage in an authentic perspective. You cannot, you do not have the liberty to play with it. And one and the other one was saying, no, that uh, heritage should just be an inspiration that you should use, you know. Uh, and you can play with it in whatever way that you want, you know. Uh, now, uh, in general, you know, what, uh, through my research, what I've come to find out is that uh, you, you can categorize heritage into two, actually. There is heritage that is monument, which is not used, you know, but there is lived-in heritage. You know, there are many, and uh, you, you, when you talk of lived-in heritage, it's a complex concept because heritage is not something that we produce today and it's finished, or it's the process of production is finished. What we are doing today, or what we are, the, the things we are creating today, might in the next five or ten years be heritage. So there is a continuous production of heritage which requires that we select, you know. But then what we, when we select, what do we do? Do we select and uh, monumentalize it and just use it as an object to see? Or do we learn lessons from it and embed those lessons in the way we create and build societies? You see, and this is the challenge that I think uh, that, that, that we face most of the time when we talk about heritage. A lot of us tend to push this uh, kind of restrictive concept of heritage where it's something that you maintain, retain and maintain. But then that is it, it's, just, it, it's for identity, it just tells you that about your history. But we are interested in creating societies that work. If the heritage we have in terms of build form and urban uh, built and uh, you know, you know, built architecture and urban forms, you know, have lessons that we can apply. Then why don't we take from them and use them to create the kind of cities that we want? I think uh, what I experienced in Oman in the five years I stayed is uh, is a country that has been able to capitalize on its heritage and to use that heritage to create an identity for itself. It's not an identity. Yes, Oman has, uh, I remember, they have more than 150 heritage sites waiting, document, uh, waiting for documentation. But then the cities themselves, you know, when you interact with, uh, with, with, the, with the cities themselves, you see a lived-in heritage because, you know, the heritage element, you know, the heritage element that uh, the country has, has, been, has, has influenced the form of the development of the cities. And so we have kind of uh, small, kind of what you can call livable cities that are not large scale or egregious in terms of forms and structures that you see. And I think that's the lesson that we need to learn from Oman, that uh, kind of uh, we should look at heritage as a way to influence, you know, as a means or as a tool to influence the way we create new cities so that they are both livable and they are kind of what you can call, they are human scale and livable for the people that we create these uh, cities for. So I think this is the whole uh, this thing that I'm, going to, that, that I'm going to be talking about, you know. Uh, Again, uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot about Omani heritage here, so I'm going to be just brief because the time is short. Uh, we know that Oman has had a lot of linkages with different places. We've heard from it, China, you know, India, and many places. They've had influence from, from all over the Gulf itself down to, to, you know, to, to Aden and other places. So, and this influ these influences have combined together to shape what you call the architecture of Oman. One interesting thing is that uh, Oman is a very diverse country, and they also have different types of settings, where, you know, in terms of environment, in terms of people, and even cultures, you know. But, and they also have a very strong building tradition. And in almost all the cases that you read in history, you'll find out that building tradition in Oman has been, has kind of, all influences have adapted 
and been applied using the building tradition. So there's a kind of common factor that ties the kind of ideas and inspirations that they get from other places. These things, the inspirations are ad adopted, but then they are adapted to the setting and they are adapted to the, you know, kind of uh, to the context of the architecture that exists there. So the aim, again, like I said, is not to not to try to begin to look at. Uh, kind of identify responses, but rather to look at it from the perspective of lived, lived in this thing, you know. Uh, just to put it in context, we have, I have a little bit of theory here, you know, always we talk about uh, conservation and preservation, you know, and we do it mostly for, we call it identity reasons, you know, uh, you know, and the framework we have for that is that everything that happens, every day that we live, we are creating history. And as, mo as long as we are creating history, we are also creating heritage. So we have a huge collection of things that we take. You know, within the history that we create, we have things that me, that kind of that, that, that becomes relics. We have things that becomes memory as part of us. We have the right to choose anything. Anything that we have created as part of this social process of creation can become heritage. You know, you cannot restrict it to a kind of a class of object or this thing. You know, any society chooses what it wants to be its heritage. So we need to understand that because we, in that case, once you begin to understand the dynamic production, it means you need to you you you, you do not kind of tr treat heritage as relic, but something that as as a lesson to learn from. Uh, so we we. This is just uh, talking that we have dynamic uh, creation of heritage. You have hundreds, you, at any moment in time, we're creating thousands of heritage and we have to choose from, you know. You know the, when we choose, the problem, of course, we face is how to retain. How do we retain this heritage? You know, how do we kind of incorporate it? How do we use it? You know, and uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to avoid going into the theory part because it just tells us that, you, you know, you can separate, you know, you, there is a process for you to choose this heritage and to kind of uh, define how you want to use it, you know. Now, uh, like we have had before, I think all of us have had, Oman has had a broad contact with different civilizations. It has impacted its, uh, its, its, its architecture. And its culture, its heritage. You know, the, the Portuguese are the, probably the most prominent ones that everybody refers to. They came with their castles that was uh, a response to kind of uh, warfare in Europe. And of course, they built it in 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 in, in, the, in the in the in the coastal areas. By the way, most of what I talk relates to the coastal area, Matra, the Batna coastal area. I don't uh, because Oman is a large country. You you have different regions. It's difficult to reconcile. A kind of what is happening in each uh, region. So you take like the castle and you find out that, yeah, it's, it's been built there, but then it has influenced the architecture. Elements have been adapted from the castle to residential architecture or to settlement architecture. So even though you find that there is no warfare, but you still find towers and uh, podiums for defense. So this is just an example of how influences flow and then they become integrated into the cultural setting, you know. So you, you have the history, which I think we don't need to go through, you know, and uh, the history, of course, with the forts, the, you know, the different forts that were this thing, and you have Muscat, which evolved as the capital, as the capital of Oman, because of the uh, Portuguese uh, establishment of the uh, kind of their forts in that area. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, the, the main thing I'm interested in is this concept of uh, ideas and building practices and how they shift. You know, and uh, what you would find is that when you look at uh, the history of Oman, Oman, Oman and the, all the influences, you see that they've been integrated to shape the, 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 the vernacular tradition of the country. And you can see these uh, traditions when you look at some of the old cities that, uh, you know, this is Rustag, and uh, you, you, when you look at some of the traditional buildings, you see these uh, influences that, as they've been uh, kind of integrated into it, you know. Uh, now, uh, <coughs> We are, we are kind of uh, interested as architects in terms of uh, in shaping modern places, you know, in shaping the, what we call the contemporary forms of cities, you know. And uh, so we ask ourselves how kind of, uh, how, should we, how should we relate to, to heritage architecture? How should we adapt heritage architecture to kind of contemporary cities? I think in, in Oman, we know that uh, kind of uh, Makia was a, a kind of a significant factor 
in the in the kind of in the in the in, in the in the ad, in, in, in advocating for the use of vernacular architecture as a basis to shape the development form of uh, of Oman. You know, <clears throat> he he was the the person who carried out some of the initial studies that kind of documented vocabulary of design, campaigned for the fact that <clears throat> we the regu this should be incorporated into regulations and they should shape the form of Omani houses. And gradually, all of these were incorporated into the municipal regulations. And uh, you know, so there was restrictions in height. There was, in, you had to vet uh, the, the, the regulations required that buildings be vetted so that they conform to a kind of a conception of an Omani style. Now, <clears throat> we might uh, question kind of whether it's authentic or it's unauthentic, because this is always an issue. But what, uh, whatever you say about it, at the end of the day, what the influence of this change that they brought about, the influence of the regulations, the influence of the documentation, led to the evolution of a style of architecture that is very visible. And everybody who goes to Oman sees that. That's the first thing people comment about, that the architecture here is unique. It has a clear cultural kind of basis. It has a clear kind of, you know, there's a clear basis in heritage. And not only that, it is. It is kind of human scale and very kind of what you call convenient to, to interact with. You know? So these are some of the kind of things that we see. And when you, I, I just put some examples of buildings. I have not bothered because uh, if you go to the work of my care, you see that, and, and even to the regulations, you see that there's specifications for elements and how to use them. You know? And we could always find them in those uh, docu documents. You know? So you, you, you find the buildings and you look at them. This is Sultan Qaboos University. You find that at any setting you go, you tend to see a composition that is kind of, it's very rational. It's not, it's, it's not exorbitant, you know what I mean? You, you look at this and you look at, say, West Bay, and you see, you see a kind of stark difference, you know? Maybe this, you say, comes close to Sukhwaki, where you are having something that is a human scale and, and kind of, and, kind of uh, more or less uh, directed towards uh, the individual. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> uh, now, most of as architects, we don't just want to look at heritage. We also want to make a statement sometimes in terms of our own activities. How do we contribute to, uh, to, to, to kind of to, to preservation of heritage or to kind of ensuring that when we have lived in heritage, we allow it to survive and allow people to use it. So uh, here I'm going to just uh, present a small project that we did with our students in Muscat. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, in, it's in Matra. You know, it's, it's, it's the, we, we did a, a kind of uh, a renewal of the Sukkot Dalam. You know, uh, the idea was that it's, it's, a, it's the most popular souk, I think, that we have in, in, in Muscat. And everybody goes there. But it, it's been going, undergoing very rapid deterioration. And so with our students, we decided to do a project to see how to kind of uh, you know, revive it. You know, it's, a, it's a student project, so we don't, we don't uh, this thing. So uh, now Motra by itself is, uh, you know, you, you know, it's a heritage uh, kind of uh, c city. I would call it, I say it's, a, it's, a, it's a heritage city because it has a lot of uh, very important uh, heritage buildings. And by the setting itself, it's very unique, you know, in terms of both in terms of history, time, and in terms of uh, the value of the distin. This is uh, this is the Motra distin, and you know, it's been it, it is a port. It has even though the port is no, it, the port has been moved now to a different location, but it has served as a port for for a very long time, you know. Now, uh, the questions we asked ourselves while trying to do this exercise is: What does Motra have as heritage to warrant its conservation? How can we? kind of intervene so that we contribute to its uh, preservation and conservation. Uh, I'm going to skip because there is a lot of, this is the, this is the souk itself. Here you're looking at the center of the souk. You know, you know the, it, in Matra also, apart from the souk itself, you have uh, the Surah al Lawatiya, which is a self-contained building that, again, is this is 400 years old. You know. yeah, so you have this kind of symbolic elements. And you have the forts, of course. So all of them combine to generate a kind of heritage setting that makes it a very useful can, is a significant tool that you can use to revive and recreate activity in the, in the whole setting, make it kind of, a, a, keep it as an active uh, setting. So uh, 
these are some of the buildings also that are within the Motra area. You have mosques, you know, heritage mosques and, 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 and this, and I'm not going to go too too much into that, you know. Anyway, when I go when we go to the this and I'll go directly to the, the the intervention. We had some challenges in intervention which we are just listing in here. Some of some of it has to be uh, kind of comes from the fact that there was rapid development and it was encroaching on the market and then also the buildings were decaying and they were not being repaired. Some of them had been turned into shops only so they, they, they kind of they they were they were deteriorating, you know. So anyway, this this is the this is the area for the project that we did. Uh, this is the the, the, the area of the the, the souk that we, we reviewed, you know. And uh, can if you, you know, it, we chose it because of its urban form again and fabric. Now we di we did a lot of different types of studies: with land use, the figure ground analysis, building heights. The students went and took data, individual buildings, you know. And then once they did that, we also do a photographic survey of all the buildings that are within the, the, the souk, you know. So th those that are dilapidated, we captured them, the state of the buildings, what is dilapidated, what is not. And then <coughs> we, 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 we got all the survey results. And based on the survey results now, we kind of uh, began to ask ourselves how how do we intervene? What are the issues we should uh, we should we should we should treat in the area? We, our focus, of course, was heritage preservation, but then it has to be backed by renewal and servicing. Because if you don't renew and you don't service, most of the old traditional areas, the, pro the key problem they face is that they don't have modern services incorporated. So you have a problem of you know kind of people living there because you don't have the necessary services to support your your lifestyle. So we, 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 we looked at all of these issues and then uh, kind of uh, we, we, we went ahead and articulated the goals, you know, which is to revive, uh, you know, you know, you know, what we, we decided was that uh, because we are trying to preserve, we are not doing large scale urban renewal, which is uh, involves rapid radical change. No, we are going to be very sensitive and try to preserve everything. Sensitive intervention to re just to rejuvenate enough intervention to rejuvenate the district and make it uh, active. You know, and the approach was to use look at it as a lived in heritage. You know, instead of just as a heritage. So you want to facilitate activities. You want to actually expand the scope of the shopping activities there so that the area now becomes uh, more active. So, so we, we articulated the goals and went to do it. These are, these are some of the uh, kind of uh, interventions that we did. First of all, to f facilitate uh, movement, we, we tried to kind of map out shopping routes and try to see how to strengthen these routes so that they become very clear and very bold in the in the in the, in the you know within the the fabric itself uh, kind of we we looked at different uh, areas so in some places they created uh, like uh, here you you know an open area it was an open area there's a, there's a, there was a fort there there's an open area there. they created created a social area there just so that you can have an open outdoor what you can call space within the, the because it's a very dense it's a very tight uh, tightly congested area. So these are some of the highlights, you know, that of the of the outcome of it. Uh, these are, so you know, we, we looked at some of the, you know, like like you have uh, some of the buildings and before and after so pictures that have been done just to to renovate the buildings. Always we, uh, kind of the encouraging the thing we encourage the students to, to do was use the traditional forms and traditional elements that are part and parcel of the language that is already in the architecture of the area. So you'd find that, that we have, like this is, this is what exists, this is what has been, it has been renovated to. So we have before and afters that shows how the distance, you, you'd find the, the intervention, is, there is intervention, but then the intervention is not very radical in a way that transforms the, this, you know. And this is, the, this is always the issue with lived in heritage. No, I mean, you, yes, you want you to intervene, but there is no way you can intervene without changing things, you know, and the question you need to ask yourself is to what level? To what level do I need to change so that I still retain the character and authenticity of the, of the, of the area itself? So these are some of the data. Also did uh, kind of studies, uh, tried to look at wind, wind movement patterns, and they created some kind of uh, areas. There is a, there is a Wiley 
office there that had a vacant land, and so they created this uh, kind of what you call dominant open space there, just to, you know, to, you know. So, and this is the Wallis office here. In. So, and this is, this is, so this is the, this thing, uh, no, now, uh, uh, if you, if you look at our projects, we had certain limitations, you know, because uh, kind of we couldn't, uh, there are certain issues we couldn't address in the project, you know, uh, we could not address, like we said, broader infrastructure. We tried to accommodate, uh, kind of produce, uh, kind of services, electricity and others as part of, but there are certain limitations that you have when you're dealing with a student uh, project, you know, and then, uh, they still, even when we are, you know, when even when we are working on uh, kind of trying to uh, kind of uh, you know re renew the the souk itself, one of the challenging issues of uh, Motra is the traffic. You still have uh, once you get out, then there is a lot of congestion that you couldn't uh, this, the, that we couldn't address, which is out of our own the, the the out of the scope of our own activity, you know. So. Some of these uh, problems still remain fundamental issues that are kind of outside the, the scope of the of the project that we're dealing with. You know, anyway, if you again, just in summary, if we look at the whole uh, concept of heritage in Oman, what we can see is that uh, yes, there's been long years of diverse contact that has led to a very unique heritage of uh, architecture in the country. Uh, that heritage has served as a basis, you know, for kind of uh, shaping the form of buildings and the, the form of cities. Because most of the time, also, if, if you look at Oman, you find that even the, the urban design is very unique because it's community oriented. You know, you usually have kind of uh, buildings that are almost arranged as a community with a hall, and, you know, for you know that, that serves as this. so. All of these things are there within the Omani context, that uh, Oman has, has shown a direction on how to approach heritage architecture in a way that you make it the guiding principle of urban development, rather than, you know, kind of creating celebrated pieces within the urban landscape of cities. Because this is the, these are the different, the, the two different approaches that we can take. I hope I'm not taking. So, uh, if you, in general, when you look at the architecture, again, like I said earlier, it is a human skill and livable environment, and it uh, invites people to come and use it. And uh, always, I think, uh, I always enjoy, I, I've lived in Udaiba, I've gone a lot to Urum and to, to, <laughs> to Motra, to, and you always want to walk, you know. And uh, I, I mean, it's only in Oman that you see, I always, uh, it's in the evening, you see everybody out on the, paving with his coffee and uh, having a good... So you tend to get a city that is uh, actually like inviting people to use, you know, every part of the city. This is the way I look at it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It is now my uh, great pleasure to introduce Haitham al uh, to speak about uh, between trade and tribalism, Oman's distinctive history of traditional settlements and architecture. Between the Tijara and the Qabaliyya, the history of the Mumayyaz for the Jammu'at al-Umraniyya and the Umara in the Sultan of Oman. Please. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I would like to introduce myself, Haytham al-Abri. Um, my main interest is about um, the way the traditional Omani settlement has shaped and the influences that contributed in shaping them with the kind of interesting diversity they have. And uh, my interest started um, when I first met a great man who inspired me to look into a large context of the history of Oman. And from that point onwards, I've been looking everywhere to try to understand how these settlements really um, exist as we see them today. So, thank you, Professor Schumann, for your wise and caring words. Um, I've been working with, um, or researching, actually, with the Archeum Center since it was established, and I have been having the privilege of learning a lot of things, working together with the team, and to explore in deep what does it mean, the traditional built environment of Oman. And um, today I'm going to talk about trade and tribalism which is another dimension that I started to look into after I have been um, exploring the kind of 
internal and external influences that shaped the traditional settlements. So with a quick brief introduction about the diversity Oman has, which I'm sure some of the scholars have already have a clear idea, but for those who doesn't know that the lo geographical location of Oman within the Gulf or the uh, Arabian Peninsula um, stands in a quite an interesting location facing the Indian Ocean, um, having this amazing kind of a Hajar range or chain mountains from Musandam till the peak on the east at Sur, which we call it Ras al Had. And this kind of amazing, um, what we call them the Hajar mountains, has gave a very interesting and distinctive um, kind of a geological and topographic identity to Oman and contributed in shaping, if we go through a cross section, we can have a clear idea about from the seaside and going up to the peak of the mountains at Jebel Shams and going down again to the desert area where we call it locally Rabi al Khali, the desert or the empty quarters. So looking into what is happening in this um, Hajar mountain range, so at the peak of it, as we can notice that everything about the um, discharge of the rain which we call them wadis or dry rivers, as I refer to some of the local terminology by some scholars, are actually giving us an idea about how the, the natural division of creating roots and territory in the area started to take place. So from that point onwards, started to define some territorial areas like the Batina region facing the coast with a clear direction towards the north, defining where the location of the desert area where resided most of the Bedouin tribes, and then the foothill areas, where there is an integration between the wadis and the agriculture fields that contributed in introducing a new way of living for the inhabitants. So moving to the research gravity this generated through different scholars. So Paulo Amcosta, for example, when he started to be interested in this, he started to investigate um, how we can actually categorize these settlements. So he went to two types that he could obviously um, find, that one which is in the mountain pigment settings and one would be the coastal setting. So he divided the mountain ones into inner and outer settlements, which is depending on their location on the wadi edge or on the foothills, like for example, Iskian al Hamra, or the coastal setting, which we can see a clear um, illustration done by him between Kalahat and, for example, Muscat. So this is the beginning of trying to understand how the typology of settlements is taking place and influenced by um, topography and geography. So another one, which is Lidwing and others in 2007, he used a more high-tech kind of way to try to understand the typology of settlements. And in this time, he used the satellite. So he tried to understand um, the vegetation uh, data set, topographic, hydrology, uh, geological, topographic. And that led him to do more analysis on understanding what kind of category we can put them into. And eventually ended up with a new kind of um, typology about plain oasis, foothill oasis, drainage, which are by the mountain, by the wadi edges, or mountain oasis, or khur, and then the urban oasis at the end. So this is now the beginning of trying to understand how different scholars have seen um, um, the different typology of settlements. Um, one of the great extensive work done by Professor Showman um, is understanding the history and the, um, what we call it, the socio-political influence that created settlements which are, we can call it mixed tribe settlements, depending on their location in Oman. So one of them was Harat al-Bilad al-Manah. And it was considered to be one of the largest settlements um, in the Dakhliya region. And some of them even would go and say it's possibly one of the largest in Oman. So he showed the different kind of tribal um, pattern that took place in the settlement. We're having about more than 20 different tribes that are coming from different parts. But most of them, of course, resided within the Dakhliya region. But this now starts to give us an idea about some kind of socio-political um, cohesiveness that started to take place to shape some of the settlements as well. And one of the um, uh, comparisons that we could look into, for example, when we talk about larger settlements with a kind of more Islamic centers, we can call them, which have been attracting the imamate, um, uh, let's say, headquarters. One of them was, for example, Nizwa, where we can see that the way that the setting of Nizwa walled 
around the whole oasis, for example, within inside, all the kind of uh, defensive features of the Nizwa fort, and then talking about how the settlement also grew inside of it, gives us an indication that this is now a different influence that started to shape the settlement. Or even if we're looking at Bahra, for example, which is under the UNESCO World Heritage Site, again, a different formation setting that we're looking at the fort itself, which is number one, and then number two, we're looking at the Jama, which is crowning the, the hill, which is, and then everything else like the traditional dwellings is clustering around that hill, a kind of a way of formation around that peak area. And then, of course, a different type, which appeared lately in the mid-17th century, which was a kind of an investment and development by um, the Imamate at that time. So this is one of the latest foothill settlements in the mid-17th century um, for Beni Riyam. It's called Harat Saibani, which was one of the focus research case studies they have done. And this now is part of a, what we call it, um, a tribal confederation, which is basically something that has been um, categorized by John C. Wilkinson in uh, 1977, which is basically that we're having a large group um, of uh, one tribe which has resided in Jebel Akhlar, and then they started gradually to move downwards towards the foothill settlement when they had the opportunity to settle down in agreement with the Imam, and I'm sure Professor Shoman has mentioned that in uh, his previous presentation. If we go further to the east, and um, here we're now talking about the Sharqiya region, um, now we're going to uh, look at a different type of setting where um, we're talking about um, an intermediate kind of um, 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 inhabitants who are between Hadr and Bedu, which is a kind of a transit point between the Bedouin areas and moving to the Hadr areas to the Pidmans. And this is kind of now um, the tribes of, um, for example, Al Harthi, or um, we're talking about uh, the ones who resided in Ibra or Al Qabil, which is Mudayrov as well, which also presented a new type of kind of settlement formation um, in a kind of a bigger context, which is less dense. We're talking about tried, um, tradesmen who actually. Um, had more connections to the outer world through their trading, and that brought them to a, a larger sense of wealth, which contributed in shaping um, larger scale buildings, and some of them even with an interesting defensive features, as in watchtowers around the area, which they would be proud of to um, have. So the major questions that I used to have is always about the factors contributing the formation of the settlement. And, the morphology, how did they shape up? How did they you know, contribute in understanding the dwelling types, the forms and space organization? But yet again, going back to the main topic now, which is about trade and tribalism, this is now a new direction I'm looking at, which is the beginning of documenting everything to do with um, tribal setting and structure in Oman. So from the beginning of the migration that started by Malik bin Fahim and the group that came with him, so. With further studies done by many scholars and then more shaped up by John C. Wilkinson, he started to classify these groups according to geographical distribution. So his direction was about understanding the settlement typologies through the sociopolitical structure. So he, he defined two types. One of them is um, formal descent group who settled in Oman, and then we have formal descent group at, that never settled as a tribe. And from that point, he, made, he have two main concentrations. One of them was the main one, and one of them was the subsidiary. And that by itself started to define the tribes that had their own exclusive dars, and then the tribes that actually were, as he called them, secondary dispersed, that were moving a lot between areas. And that actually started to show some kind of influence with their migration from one point to another, depending on what actually made them migrate from these points onward. So if we move to see a, a more focused look on Jebel Akhdar, so we start to notice that, of course, these gray kind of dots are more showing the, where the settlement locations are in the Hajar Mountain region. So you will notice that the, the increase of the size of the settlements as you, as you descend down from the peak to the foothill areas where we start to see the large centers like Bahla or Nizwa or Iski, where these areas or these new settlements start to become more attractive for um, the tribes that has resided rather at the top of the mountain or even the ones that are considered to be, let's say, partially Hadri, partially Bedouins, who attracted them to come to these areas where 
the mouth or let's say the final discharge area of the wadi is there which is giving them a more attraction towards understanding that these are the main routes where the wealth is the prosperity so all these kind of um, believe that they have that all the wealth and discharge which is coming from the mountain area are at these points where it started to bring up all the people together which started to present the mixed tribe settlements so if we go to the let's say the top of the mountain where we can see actually more focused tribal groups but if we go now to the foothills everything started to be a mixed kind of tribal settlements which is bringing people together and that's what made even uh, the imamate at that time focus their um, residents and being in these areas like Bahla or Nizwa or Izki or even if we go to the other side of the mountain towards al Batina, they chose Rastak for example so because these are actually um, controlling points for not only for the mountain and as a gateway but also bringing people together to talk to so what end up with all this kind of connections in the mountain um, from the um, north to the east is that all this started to shape up the northern part of Oman on the Hajar Mountains to be a kind of a tribal territorial map where each tribe has defined their own place and from that point of course according to the geographical point of view or um, what are they actually controlling as an access or resources that has also defined the way of living that they chose to have so basically like for example if we're looking at um, the Beni Riyam, for example, at uh, this area over here, the Beni Riyam is actually the ones that I've mentioned in Harat al-Saybani, who are at the top of the mountain, and then they also had the um, Harat al-Saybani uh, settlement which came in the mid-17th century to protect and control that access point to the mountain. And then afterwards, <coughs> sorry, um, let's say at the same time the Abriyin also took a large portion of longitudinal um, control between al Batina and um, let's say the Jof area which we call it in Oman so basically that becomes a kind of a bridge controlling such resources and also bringing a lot of alliances so that's why one of the reasons is that many tribes like for example Beni Riyam or even after the Imamate came took um, alliance with the Labrayeen as to be protectors and uh, warriors for them so if we look at the trade at, from the other side which we have now two types for the first trade is with the Bedouins, which is the inner part of Oman, the lands. So we're having about, let's say, there are two types of migration that take place. The Bedouin pasture in the ground summer, which we're referring to them as these hatch dashed lines. And then we have the Bedouins in the winter, <coughs> sorry, which are actually um, migrating on the other side. So basically what we're having is a kind of a cycle which is happening between um, their migration between the summer and the winter time to indicate the kind of trade that is happening so basically if we're looking at for example now the um the mountain area the Hajar mountain area where where we're having the cattle breeding where the normans are basically that's one uh type of trade that they're doing with the bedouins when they come to oman at that time so that by itself starts to bring some kind of um let's say different seasons of wealth to these settlements at different parts and at the same time if we're looking at where we have the Hajar mountain area which is referred to as an S in this um, uh, map again as well they are doing between summer and winter different kinds of products that contribute in the kind of exchange they're having so again parallel to that the trade with the sea of course so we know from the strategic location of Oman that it's becoming a kind of a bridge between the east and west to um, most of the countries on both sides between Egypt and Africa or Europe and between China and India so that location by itself with of course the main contribution about having the proper wind which also man is ma managed to master managed to create a very huge wealth of ports that are actually feeding into the economy of Oman at that time so all of that contributed in bringing import and export of different goods to the area so we're having for example imported from india rice spices textile clothing wood for shipbuilding as well and on the other on the, on the export side dates dry roots pearls uh, shark fins almonds herbs uh, medicine everything that can be produced in oman in exchange and of course similar 
to what is happening between the exchange with Africa at the same time. So this kind of um, exchange contributed in bringing not only just transferring knowledge from these areas and goods, but also contributed in bringing a new kind of a transformation of uh, social, political life to these areas, like, for example, the coastal lines. So if you're trying now to understand how does that work with the Bedouins and the, uh, let's say, the coastlines, so we're basically talking about the first um, area, the first zone, which is producing the, let's say, some kind of fruit, special kind of fruit and vegetables at the top of the mountain, like Al Jabal Akhdar, where they have, um, starting from the rose water to um, walnuts to pomegranate and so on. And then the second zone, which is the, let's say, the um, Piedmont area or the foothills, where, they, where we have most of the um, um, uh, agriculture fields. Um, and then we have the mastering of different um, crafts that has been done by the people there. And then we have on the south side, the Bedouin zone, which is coming from this side at the south. And then we have, of course, finally, the coastal area on the other side. So basically, this is the kind of um, introducing what we have is like the red zone in this area is becoming a kind of an intermediate market between the two sides, between the Bedouins and between the coastlines. The green area becomes the main exchange route between the two sides. So now this is now starting to reflect the kind of exchange that is happening between these three zones. So we have between the first zone, which is considered to be the exchange on the two sides. We have, of course, the second zone, which is connecting between um, the big markets like Nizwa or Bahra that is dealing with the Bedouins on one side, and then, of course, the Batina coast on the other side, like Rostock and so on. So this is now starting to give us an idea about the kind of influences that started to take place on different areas radiating from the Hajar mountain area. And of course, from the coastline, it's due to deal with different kind of overseas trades and so on. So going back to the two main settlements that I was um, working on, um, these two settlements, Al Hamra in uh, uh, Dakhliya region and Harat al Saibani, they're both being established at the same time um, during the mid 17th century. But the difference is that Al Abriyin was a more of a one kind of one tribe, exclusive Dar. And then this is a kind of a more confederational tribe coming from uh, Jabal Akhdar. Both um, kind of resided on a main um, gateways to. Um, uh, this one is actually guarding the main access to Jabal Shams. This one is actually guarding the main access to Jabal Akhdar. And both of them contributed in, of course, controlling these kind of access points. So with the investment of the Imam at that time, which helped them to excavate the water channels to reside in these areas like Faraj al-Khatmain and Faraj al-Hamra. So the wealth and prosperity and economy started to flourish in these areas. And then a new kind of market was introduced. So this market actually, like the one in Al-Hamra, for example, started to be outside the settlement, um, not, not to what we have seen in the previous settlement, which is integrated within the same fabric. But this time in Al-Hamra, it was considered to be somewhere outside. And in Harat al-Saybani, it was also in a separate settlement nearby, like an extension called Harat al-Wadi. And these settlements by themselves, because they were introduced with new markets, they introduced also a new social structure to the settlements. So they had to have new people to work in these settlements, uh, or sorry, the souk area, and then of course to uh, follow up with the trading that has been done by the merchants at that time. So looking at the settlements that have these different kind of markets, a different kind of um, geographical locations. So we can find that the mixed tribe settlements, like for example, one of them is Nizwa, for example, where we have most of the people that came from different parts of the Dakhliya region. Um, influences that come with, for example, that it's considered to be an Islamic center where people went there just for to learn or to um, exchange goods because it was considered to be a flourishing area. So. Even the wadi itself, like a lot of people were questioning why would a large settlement like this be established in an inner area between wadis, you know, dividing into different parts. Well, the wadi been for, for the tradesmen, like from the Bedouin side or whoever is even coming on the coast, is considered to be a large flat area for exchange. Similar to the history that we know uh, lately about, for example, Sukhwakov, that they come and they are all standing and selling goods and so on. So in Bahla, for example, the same thing, but 
the exchange now is a bit different, that we're dealing with a specific type of goods, which comes actually from um, a district or a wilaya called Ibri, which is more towards the border with UAE. So basically the trade from inside the uh, Gulf area was coming from that side. Um, Manah, for example, is considered to be um, like the first stop area for the Bedouins to come and exchange goods. So basically that also gives us an idea about the kind of wealth that took place in that area because one of the things that are quite um, interesting in Manah is that being a world settlement, there is no actually separate market that is standing for these people. Actually, some of these small shops were just integrated part of the fabric of the settlement, but in relation to uh, the exchanging of the goods with the Bedouin, everything was happening outside the settlement, and of course that is to control the kind of access and kind of maintaining the social privacy inside the settlement. So, looking at how does that all work, so we can now try to understand that Within these kind of geographical settings that are happening in the different parts of Dakhliya, like Bahla, Izki, Nizwa, and Manah, so understanding how all the natural shaping of the, um, let's say, the water discharge that comes from the wadis, that people believe that this is where the root of wealth and exchange happens and attracted them. So we can now understand that this is now one of the reasons why they brought a lot of mixed kind of a social structure to these settlements and people managed to live in prosperity and cohesiveness and the only variety that could happen is that um, the fabric would be um, changing according to the increase or changes that happen with built and rebuilt or even sometimes in war zones. Um, but the connection again between trade is also happening between the different settlements like the exchange that the tradesmen that come from Bahla to uh, to come from uh, sorry, Ibri to Bahra and then Tunis. So that kind of cross exchange is happening even horizontally and also vertically towards the mountain that is going up to the other side. So this is the kind of now connection transit points that we're starting to understand. The migration, um, the seasonal migration for trade or even the temporary um, social change that happens seasonally between these settlements to bring wealth and to bring as well um, exchange of goods to different parts of it. So this is now just to start with the um, consideration of kind of influence that is happening between trade and tribalism at this stage. And um, hopefully by um, the, the next year's um, conference, I would be talking in more detail about how that started to integrate part of the architecture inside the settlements, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you all so very much for your excellent presentations. Uh, we have only about 10 to 12 minutes maximum for <laughs> maximum for Q&A uh, so that you can get out and have some coffee and refresh. Uh, I, I just have a couple of questions uh, to Shumel and to uh, Haysam. Okay, yeah. Uh, and uh, I am coming to uh, this topic from the standpoint of anthropology. Uh, and, and that was also uh, really uh, created this, you know, uh, my interest in this to try to find out if ethnicity has anything to do with the question of settlement. Uh, for example, Shimon, you talked about the Baluchis. Do you see any association between this migratory history and settlement, for example? Uh, by the same token, I wanted to ask Haysam. Uh, Haysam, uh, you, you talked, you touched uh, on um, the Omani relationships to Africa, and of course we know that Oman and Zanzibar has been uh, mutually inclusive in terms of you know, uh, population exchange and presence. Uh, so about the, uh, the Omanis who uh, went back, for example, to, uh, to Oman, the Zanzibaris who went back. Uh, I understand that they went to Ebra, <coughs> mostly, for the most part. Yes. Uh, is there any uh, difference or in what way uh, did their settlement patterns differ or resembled those of already established settlement that you talked about. How do they fit in in the uh, scenario of tribalism that you, you talked about? Okay, okay so... Uh, if Heather wants to go for that, 
Yes, yes. Uh, sure. Yeah, 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 please. Okay. Um, and then you can. Right, okay. Um, regarding the influence of the, um, the Omanis who resided in um, Zanzibar for uh, a while, well, actually, um, first of all, um, when they moved to Zanzibar, they have also made another influence, which is um, if you visit Zanzibar today, you will still be amazed that some of the traditional settlements which has been established by these Omanis are quite typical to what you see in the Dakhliya region within the same kind of fabric. But at the same time, who went back from um, Zanzibar to Oman afterwards within that same period of time were actually influenced by the kind of the way that scale of the buildings were in Zanzibar that they tried to reflect that sense of detail, sense of scale, um, um, the kind of spacing that they have between the structures. Like if we look at back to what is happening in Ibra at Minzafa, um, we never see this kind of spacing between buildings where everything is scattered in that area and they have these kind of open areas for exchange, trading and so on. Um, uh, not like what we see in the Dakhliya region, for example. Um, so that's one of the influences that were exchanged between these two parts at some point. And till present day, that connection and presence is still there. Like um, the people who are now in Ibra, um, I wouldn't say the majority, but a high percentage of them speak the language, Swahili. And um, they still exchange visits as well. And um, they also look into a lot of details when they look at the buildings. Like, for example, if I look to the Dakhliya region, um, the art of simplicity is more present in the way we shape the volumes, the spaces. But when we look to a place like, for example, um, Ibra, we start to see these buildings represent a sense of um, uh, details, some grandness, in the sense that you can call them almost palaces, in the details they have, the quality of building they used, which was considered to be very impressive during that time. Yeah. Sorry, if I can just add to that one is, um, uh, obviously the Mazrui tribe, uh, Mazrui's played a very important role in, um, in the whole of the Eastern African literal, and um, they, they, uh, the interactions between the kind of Mazrui groups in Rostock and uh, in, in, say, areas like in Mombasa and so on is kind of quite very interesting to study. Uh, I think uh, what Haytham was also indicating is this, um, uh, the large buildings, you know, which is obviously uh, an acquisition of wealth, um, and they um, create special sort of uh, enclaves, if you like, within within uh, settlements itself. So Ibra has got, in southern Ibra, there is Menzafa, you know, which is an exclusive sort of merchant kind of group of people, you know, which creates these fantastical mansions and so on. Um, but also the trade brings in uh, carpentry from India via East Africa. So a door from the Kalili house in uh, Boucher, is, which was imported around 1720s. And it's, it's still there, uh, or, well, <laughs> just about probably gone. Uh, so there are, there are a number of very specific, but also quite kind of, uh, you know, at different scales, if you like, you know, of uh, um, influence. Uh, looking back at the Muscat uh, issue of Baluchi, uh, I mean, we make a mistake of again uh, forgetting the granularity of these uh, groups. They are incredibly diverse, and that's not only just the Baluchis, there's the Zidgalis who have a sort of some you kind know, of very kind of somewhere uh, the language sits between Kachi and uh, Baluchi. Uh, they possibly also have. A Persian root than a, um, uh, sorry, the, a slightly uh, non-Persian root, I would say, because the Baluchis are very Persianized groups. Um, so you'd have sort of mixture of groups and people with slightly different dialects, languages, and so on sitting. And that has defined the various names of the quarters around uh, uh, Muscat. So you'll have, uh, you know, Zidgal, you'd have, uh, you know, Bahrain, Bahraini, uh, you'll have um, uh, Azmi, uh, you know, so there are kind of groups uh, which then define particular neighborhoods, 
okay uh, and they are there very very much about these various groups coming from persia from baluch baluchistan different groups of baluchis as i said um and also um uh, bahrainis and so on and so forth so there is uh, and the wedding practices therefore are quite diverse uh if you think about muscat probably the majority are not of so-called arab uh, origin uh and this is really very important for a, co a port town you know that we uh, we tend to forget the co incredible cosmopolitan makeup of these places and that i think is very important to understand that you know that's what has shaped the identity of many of these places and we should keep that alive really that is exactly why we continue to be fascinated with the people and society of oman yes nadir i have a question that I have seen, I have a question relating to the formalism of such as Sultan Qaboos University that Shebu showed and the very organic forms of the traditional settlements that have been shown by Schumann and Haitham. Uh, could you explain who designed the master plan of Sultan Qaboos University and how did that European classical formalism come to Oman? So, thank you. So, I don't, I can't really uh, remember the architect of the Sultan Qaboos University. I, I said I can't really remember the architect of the Sultan Qaboos University. But uh, usually, I think uh, we just finished an accreditation uh, in our school. And one of the things that they say is uh, kind of, I mean, uh, architecture in the, in the Arab world is a lot of the times very formal in terms of organized forms and shapes, you know, the combinations of forms, shapes, and patterns. So I think it's th this idea of formalism is already embedded within the architecture of the, the, of the, of the region. You know? So that the university is only an expression of that formalism, I think. Yeah. Further questions or time for coffee? Yes, we'll take the last question. Uh, just one question for Mr. Um, uh, 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 excuse me, you have uh, spoke uh, in your excellent uh, paper, but uh, I think that uh, the Falaj as the system of irrigation have an influence in uh, the settlement of the tribe uh, because they participate in the activity, agricultural activity, isn't it? Or because I, di uh, I didn't listen uh, this word and this uh, system of irrigation if uh, they participate uh, in the movement of uh, the tribe. And uh, I have uh, a question, uh, if you don't mind, uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Schumann. Uh, why uh, in uh, majority of the mosque, uh, Ibadit mosque, without the minaret? I feel that that is um, a much deep-rooted um, formal typologies that um, existed in central Oman. And I do not think that this is uh, an, about, uh, an issue of um, subsistence economy. I do not think that that was the case, because then that would have also not resulted in um, elaborate arches to uh, create arcades, because they need resources, uh, or for that matter, the mihrab, which is an enormous amount of wealth uh, being invested into it. Uh, yet at the same time, they did not change it to a minaret. There's only one uh, debatable potential minaret that uh, of burnt bricks, uh, of fired bricks, which is in Bahlab. And except that, there is nothing, no example that exists in central Oman at all. So my understanding is that I think there are both in terms of the mosque form, uh, but also its various components. It's following a very long established tradition of um, uh, religious structures, uh, which has gone through complex um, cultural, uh, it pulls in a kind of wide cultural field of uh, influence into it. We know for sure that there is a much longer 
uh, existing and a kind of a longer extended influence of various uh, elements of South Arabian culture, which persisted right, you know, into into the kind of more recent times. Um, there are many practices which still go back to two very ancient pasts. Uh, there are uh, anthropological practices, engagement with the land, the landscape, the revival of uh, fallage systems and so on, which are not um, so uh, clearly uh, categorizable, you know, if you like. So there are, there are a number of things that happen around culture, which uh, I think is, this is a kind of expression of that, you know, in, in that sense, yeah. Yep. Um, regarding the um, water sources you were talking about, the traditional irrigation system, the afflage, um, yes, it's one of the main aspects or considerations about defining where settlements would be located. But um, at the same time, one of the main considerations they thought about while settling is, of course, having a place which is considered to be naturally defensive and they have a sense of controllability on their territory. So extending the fellow channels to any distance which they would think about is not an issue because also one of the good things which has been documented, and I'm sure Harriet will talk more about that, is um, that the Omanis has mastered the excavation of fellages in Oman, and finding water was not quite con considered a big issue con um, in relation to more important issues about how to secure your resources. Like, um, for example, if it's Nizwa or the Bahala Oasis, we'll notice that the whole oasis was walled, actually, and protected, just to make sure you can have enough resources to control. In relation to the water distribution and the extension even of the settlements, and I'm sure um, Harriet also will have more details about that, is that even the water shares has been properly managed, distributed. Even the extension of the fellow channel, up to what point it can go, is depending on that. So basically, if I see a settlement which is only, let's say, 200 houses, and I might question today, why would it be 500? It's because that measurement has been considered from that time. Even the ability to build or establish new agriculture lands, it's not a, it's not a problem, but it's about controlling the amount of water you can distribute and, you know, for domestic use, for irrigation, and so on. So basically, that has been considered through the establishment and deciding where to settle in these areas. Okay. Uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for your exciting presentations, and we do look forward to continuing in the very near future. Uh, please uh, feel free to get some coffee and uh, walk around in this beautiful building.